everybody. Welcome to New World Pictures Podcast. Oh my gosh. This is the end of Corn Tober. And boy, do we have See, an interview. It's not true. It's not I'm, true. I'm sorry. It, it is. I feel like Corn Tober stays with me all year long. Yep. It's like a yep. permanent fixture. It's just in the calendar in this month, mm-hmm. but Corn Tober will follow you wherever you go. That's right. No matter what part of Nebraska you go to, Corn Tober mm. will follow you. I'm Ryan. With me, as always, is Mark. I, hi. <laughs> and Erica. <laughs> and I'm telling you, we have a crazy good interview for you. We had an amazing conversation with producer, director, Donald P. Borchers. He's definitely a guy that uh, since we started this podcast, I was really hoping that we would have a chance to talk to and mm-hmm. We, boy, did we, because we are going to, this is, this is going to be part of a series of conversations we have with mm-hmm. him. Um, but we're going to talk about a lot of stuff with Donald. The starting of his career, you know, we've talked to a few people that were worked on Beyond Our Control, which is a sort of teen um, sketch comedy show that was with Daniel Waters, who wrote Heather's, worked on it. We talked to David Simpkins, who worked at New World, was the big catalyst for Children of the Corn and also wrote uh, Adventures in Babysitting and many other TV shows and movies. Um, And we also talked to Donald Borgers, who worked there as a consultant. So we're going to talk to him about the beginning of his career, and we'll start at that point. But then he's worked on The Fog. He worked on Eye for an Eye, Escape from New York. We're going to talk about a man called Horse, Beastmaster, Angel, Children of the Corn. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of movies, including... Some movies that he mentioned that were nearly New World that I'm not going to spoil. You're going to have to just listen and figure it out for yourself. But boy, do we have some good selections mm-hmm. for nearly New World episodes. We've got a lot in here. Yeah. So um, we are very grateful that we got to talk to Donald. He obviously is a big part of the second iteration of New World Pictures after Corman sold New World Pictures and sure. if you Roger P. Corman sold New Roger World P. Pictures. Corman, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, and he did a bunch of movies. Obviously, he produced Children of the Corn. He produced Angel. He produced Crimes of Passion. He produced uh, Vamp. He got a lot of those things going. And a lot of the other movies that we talk about and movies that he's worked on, you can see all of them on his YouTube page. Yeah. So if you go to youtube.com slash C slash Donald P. Borchers OG. You can go to his YouTube page and you can find all of the movies that we're going to be talking about. There's a bunch of other stuff on there, too. He's got like a horror section. He's got all the movies from Robert Vincent O'Neill, who directed the first two Angel films and the other films that he directed. Um, There's also a section in memoriam for Sandy Howard, which Donald will talk about a whole lot when he worked for Sandy Howard, um, who also produced um, Angel as well. And just like a whole bunch of stuff is conversations with Jonathan Elias, who did a lot of the the scores, did the score for Children of the Corn and a bunch of the other movies that Donald Borchers produced and also the movies that Donald produced post New World. So a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff. It is jam packed. So we highly recommend that you go and check out his YouTube page. And uh, before we dive into just want to say one last thing and want to thank Larry Karaszewski, who really helped us get this interview. Yeah. Uh, without him, we wouldn't get uh, this interview. So thank you so much, Larry, if you're listening. Mm-hmm. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you for hooking us up because what an amazing conversation with Donald. A huge part of New World Pictures' is history. We we're very fortunate. So here's our conversation with Donald P. Borchers. Okay, how about we start in um, with Be- Beyond Our Control because we've been able to talk to a few people that were involved in that show. We just spoke with David Simpkins uh, and we spoke with Daniel Waters. Can you talk about how you got involved on the show and what your role was? Yes, um, I w- had a very different experience than everyone else you'll talk to. Um, my experience was uh, coming from the state of New York in junior high school. I was in um, a youth association called Junior Achievement. Now, for, for people who don't know what that is, it's like a business version for kids, what the Boy Scouts does to nature and um, mountaineering um, 
junior achievement does to business balance sheet sales and profits. You start a company and, and you, you experience business things. So um, I had had a very successful run as a so-called junior achiever. Um, I won many awards and my company won many awards. And when I was off to college, one of the first things I thought was pay it forward. I'll be an advisor for a junior achievement company. And, um, and I became an advisor for a junior achievement company. And after a year doing that, I then found out about this beyond our control group. So I went, met with the godfather of it all, Mr. David Williams. I'm sure you've heard his name. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, it was just one of the most enchanting meetings I've ever had in my life. I, I felt like I was meeting um, my fairy godmother. And uh, literally, uh, I felt like I was talking to somebody who could help forge the shape of my life and uh and, and he said you know what you, you're too old to be in the program you know you are you it has an age limit of high school um but i'll take you on as an advisor you know none of us know how to do a balance sheet <laughs> okay <laughs> so so i became the uh if you will business advisor reporting directly to joe dundon the head of sales but working with the art director, Denny Laughlin, from time to time, as Dave would think up things for me to do, he, he went on to get me an internship. I was attending Notre Dame, and Dave worked at WNDU, which at the time was on campus. And, um, and, and so you could do internships, and, and he got me an internship at the TV station, and I, I did uh, radio commercials on television and, and stuff like that. And I, I worked with um, his then protege, uh, Danny Lakin, an amazing man who you should interview just because he worked on Beyond Our Control. Okay, uh, it was that's where you met uh, you met David David Simpkins on that show, correct? I met David Simpkins and Larry Karaszewski on the show. I was also very good friends with the late Tom Mankey and the late Bob Medich, um, and, and well, Dave Williams was a very close friend of mine. Uh, so that's how I got in, into the show. While I was there, we that was the year we won the um, Chicago International Film Festival Award, the Gold Hugo. Francois Truffaut's film, Small Change, was in competition that year. Okay. I think they got the silver. Wow. And so you went from there and, and you then moved out to Los Angeles after the show? Uh, my direct movement was, uh, was to... Uh, I had a peculiar life's event in, in the fall of 77, I contracted pneumonia and mm. I was, I was en route to a double degree uh, of both business administration of majoring on finance and then theater arts w w was my double degree. And I thought that would be a good way for, I thought good way for me to enter the film business. But mm. after the pneumonia and having had enough credits to get the degree in business, I opted to just stop going to school and I moved to Hawaii for my health. And I worked huh. for a, a tour company that I had been working for for the last two summers based out of Chicago called Cartan Travel. Now, the interesting thing about Cartan Travel, it, it's really interesting. They're owned by a company called Carte Blanche. It's a credit card company. Right. Which for crazy reasons... After the aviation company from the 60s and 70s, which named themselves Avco for aviation company, Avco, after they started to make a, a bunch of money, they started to make crazy investments in not the aviation industry, the film business. <laughs> so <laughs> the first thing they did was they bought out Joe Levine, you know, and that's how Embassy Pictures became Avco Embassy Pictures. Huh. And, a, and a crazy amount of people from Africa Embassy Pictures ended up over at New World after Roger right. Corman sold the company. No coincidence. Um, it, it was a team that was used to working together. So, so my first step was to go to Hawaii. And then after eight months in Hawaii, I had been convinced by a man from, from Chicago named Bill Bussey, who actually inherited the, the Bussey Bread Bakery of South Bend, Indiana. He's a very successful baker now. It, and so I, I met Bill Bussey, and, um, and, and he said, yeah, how old are you? And I said, 21. He said, get the fuck out of Hawaii. And, and I said, <laughs> wow. He said, you're making more money right now on sales commissions and tips than you could do in any job straight out of college. And it's quite attractive. He says, but here's the thing. I'm, I'm 20 years older than you, and I'm making the same money. He says, you're not going to make more. Mm. There's, no, there's no growth here. You, you start out. 
you, you start out at a nice sales job commission that's very attractive. And I'm very, like you, there was people paying cash for um, brand new high-end sports cars after six months of working there. Mm. Uh, it, was, it was good money. And, and he said, what you got to do is you got to find an old white guy because you're a young white guy. <laughs> and he says, I'm not trying to be racist. He says, I'm just trying to tell you how your career will work. He says, you got to find an old white guy who makes movies, is successful and lonely, and then tell him you'll work for him for free if you can train on his desk for six months. And so I pocketed this advice and didn't think much of it, but I did get um, accepted into USC uh, film school. And so I flew back in September of that year to, uh, to learn how to make movies. And I remember clearly, it was, it, I paid cash. Like I said, I was making great money in Hawaii. So scholarship, we need a scholarship. I just wrote him a check. You know, hmm. uh, I, I had the money. Wow. So that's so impressive. I, I, it was good money. Yeah. It, and that's, wow. a, that's, a, that's a whole other story about how that got corrupted. Um, so I'm at USC. And it's my fourth day in a lecture. And, um, and I'm actually very confused at this point. And it was like a toggle st- stick question did you mean this or did you mean that this or that and i'll and i won't be confused anymore so i raised my hand and, and the professor says put your hand down <laughs> put my hand back up <laughs> and he says well, i just told you put your hand you got any questions you asked the teaching assistants in the tutorial he said, look just a quick question the time we've spent would have answered it he says if you don't like this you can march your ass over to the um regent's office and get a refund and i said um, I'll, I'll tell him you sent me and i picked everything up and i went over to the regent's office and i got a refund and it was that easy once they heard i was sent. <laughs> and and so then um i i reported back to my cohorts in chicago that i wanted to meet the guys at the aviation company that owned the av columbus side so my Cartan friends in Chicago um, hooked me up with a guy who uh, didn't work at the aviation company, Avco Embassy, but he worked at Carte Blanche. And he actually used to be my boss two years earlier in Chicago. He had relocated and moved up the corporate ladder. Pure coincidence, named Robert Agard, Robert C. Agard. And, and boy, did he have a place in Chicago. He had one of the old speakeasies that had the, the tunnel mm, system. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, Wow, and he did, and he did a full '30s bar up in his basement, and it was a big deal whenever there was a travel convention. So Bob uh, says, "Oh yeah, they're, they're, I, I know the treasurer of Avco Embassy. Yeah, yeah, he he works downtown with me in the same building, which is by the way across the street from the ambassador where uh, Robert Kennedy got assassinated, mm. um, or, or Embassy, whatever the name of that hotel was, about three thousand Wilshire, and and so we worked at, at the high rise just across the street, just just." west of it and he says uh yeah the treasurer he hates to drive home after work because he could either sit in traffic for two and a half hours or he could sit in the bar with me for two for two hours and then make it home in an hour so (laughs) so we have a drink every every day after work he says why don't you come down i'll introduce you to him so um i had learned all the tricks of of being um a rambling gambling kind of guy so when roger (laughs) When Roger Burlard, the treasurer of Avco, says, uh, you want to play dollar poker? Sure. I just happen to have, unbeknownst to you, a dollar that has six zeros on it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so you were ready. And I was ready. I cleaned up, swept up, mopped up, and had a fistful of cash, and Roger was impressed. And, <laughs> and we started talking about this or that, and he says, look, the best I can do, I can offer you... Um, an entry level junior accounting job. What you'll be doing is you'll be taking little sales slips and copying them into a ledger so that our people can prepare foreign statements for the producers. I, I said, okay, you know, to start 200 bucks a week, I could get my rent covered. It was 1978. You could actually rent a place for 200 bucks a week in Hollywood in 78. Wow. 200, 200 bucks a month in Hollywood in 78. Sure. sure. It, and no, so, um, I, I, t- I took the job and, um, and, and I started. And after just two months there, I suggested to him that although I was by far a pro, I had learned how to write Fortran when I was in college. And I said, you know, every single thing, all 12 of us are doing at this desk, you know, at the point in time, the guy's making the entry that he gives us to copy into something to be recopied, everything could be completed. You just make that one entry into the computer. 
and, and the computer can then compute. <laughs> and, and Roger says, tell me more. And so he says, write up a plan. So I wrote a business plan and they hired this guy named Leo and he came in and they bought a Fortran 4 and they computerized the whole department. I got an intern that summer. Her name was Gail Katz. And yes, that's the same Gail Katz that went on to produce Wolfgang Peterson's movies. Wow. She was my she was my summer intern and our greatest joy was playing Giotto. And yes, that's the game that became Wordle. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, we, we played Giotto like on, on the phone. We'd intercom each other, you know, in Giotto, 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 Giotto. And, and Gail's, <laughs> Gail's dad owned that diner over on um, Wilshire Boulevard about eight blocks uh, east of the, the ocean in Santa Monica. And so it was great knowing Gail because whenever you were totally busted, you could eat for free. It pops. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so um, then what happened was I'm there for just about four months now, and it's approximately the beginning of 70, 79. And I see this young woman walking into Roger Burlidge's office, and they're in quite an animated conversation. It turns out she's Deborah Hill. And Roger's explaining to her and i can hear the conversation the door is closed mm -hmm. it's a glass cubicle and i can hear the conversation and i am not the closest desk wow <laughs> and so and so um he's explaining that there's not a bat chance out of hell he'll ever fucking allow one million dollars of this company's money to go to a production that doesn't have a production account and she's mm -hmm. explaining how she doesn't need some upstart uh, neophyte who doesn't know anything about the movie business um, handling her money. And, and he says, well, what did you do on Halloween? And she says, Mustafa Akkad deposited uh, in the neighborhood of $280,000 in a checking account. And I had the checkbook. And every time we needed something, I wrote a check. And I deducted it. And I knew what the balance was. And Roger says, <laughs> I just said, you know, Deborah, that's you can't really make a million dollar movie like that. You're really going to need an account. And we're going to need weekly cost statements. And, and at the time, I was uh, single in Los Angeles, and it was the 70s. And, and I had uh, decided I didn't want to be one of those guys that unbuttoned his shirt and wore um, gold or, or silver jewelry. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be one of those guys that unbuttoned his shirt and wore a skinny necktie that was starting at the third button down. And, uh, and that was my thing. And so I'm sitting there at work in my little brown shirt with my skinny necktie with the two buttons open, copying fucking numbers into a fucking ledger, playing Giotto with Gail. And because I had an ROTC Navy scholarship to Notre Dame, I defiantly wanted to wear my hair very long in my 20s. Just an overreaction in life. So I'm, I'm wearing this hair that's too long for an office with um, a shirt and a tie that's wrong for the office, yet technically meets all the office tie and shirt requirements. <laughs> and, uh, and, sh and she sees that I'm the contra person in the room and she says, OK, I'll have an accountant if it's that guy. And, and it was like Marlo Thomas on the TV show. The <laughs> finger got pointed at me and I got pinned. If for no reason <laughs> other than how I look. It, it, as simple as is that. And, and, <laughs> And, and Roger asked me if I, I would do this for him. And I was like, well, what do I get out of it? You know, I've learned early in life, <laughs> quid pro quo. And, and they said, well, we'll give you a substantial bonus. What I had not learned is how insubstantial it was compared to the cost of actually hiring a production accountant. <laughs> 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 if I only knew. Right. Um, but, but it was better than copying fucking numbers on a piece of paper all day and playing Jono. So <laughs> I, I, that was my, my um, at that point, second major experience. Along the way during those four months, we had co-financed a show with NBC called Golden Girl starring Susan Anton. And uh, it was suspected that the producer of the show was stealing. And it was suspected that the completion bond representative a very booksome blonde who was uh, a B actress had been put in charge of check signing and finances <laughs> inexplicably. Well, it was explicable to me. And, <laughs> um, and, and, and they asked me if with my travel background, I would go and take a look and do an audit of all the British U S travel expenses on the show. They seem to be coming in over budget. 
So I knew a, a great deal about um, air ticketing and I knew what all the code words were and I knew which things like um, NSF, and I don't know if I got the initials right 30 years later, but it, it meant that you there was no refund to the holder of the ticket. You, you could not render the ticket for refund. All you could do with that ticket is declare it destroyed, missing, or used. And the account that purchased the ticket was eligible to be either declared used or lost or destroyed or stolen, in which case the account could be refunded. So what was happening was Danny Donovan would have this travel agent buy the $10,000 each round trip ticket for however many producers, directors, and stars were coming over from England. And it numbered about six or seven. And then he would have that 60 or 70,000, 10 grand a pop, first class all the way, um, paid for directly by the production company. And then in weekly intervals, he would take each one of those actual used tickets and put it in his petty cash envelope and ask for $10,000 in cash, which hmm. our book some beautiful blonde B actress was happily signing because she sees a receipt and she knows it's used. And she hmm. sees an invoice and she knows it's used. And she isn't able to put two and two together and get four and see it's the same invoice and the same ticket. Just make a schedule and you can figure this out. And, um, and I made a schedule and I figured it all out. And I found not only hundreds of thousands of dollars, they were so impressed. The bond company themselves asked me to go to Danny's house and take a physical inventory of its contents. Oh, wow. In, 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 in one closet alone, I found all of the um, wardrobe that had been purchased for the Olympic sequences, which you would expect would be given away or sold off or returned to the sure. studio. You wouldn't expect the producer to be hiding them in his second bedroom closet in a rental house in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they thought I could do no wrong. Deborah Hill asked me to be the accountant on the fog. I was the accountant on the fog. And, and, and that was quite um, uh, a great experience for me because Deborah didn't hire so many people as that, that saying, hurry up and wait you know, like on, on a movie set. Sure. Because, you know, while they're doing this, we're waiting to do that. No, while we're doing this, we're about to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tommy Lee Wallace uh, was the editor of the movie. He was also the art director. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, you know, he's art directing by day and screening dailies by night with John and taking editing notes. You know, I mean, it, it was like that all the way through the production. So, here I am. They had not yet invented a software program that worked on a portable computer. So I, I'm doing the accounting literally with manual spreadsheets. I'm taking together with glue and using pencil and that, that green column paper that you used to remember at the store. Yeah. And I'm doing the and I'm doing the books. And, and so the first problem I have is I got to make payroll and I don't know what the fuck payroll is. So um, <laughs> I ask uh, Deborah's. Uh, if I could call her attorney and, and, and she says, yes, I can. And, and I suggest to the attorney, he might do well to recommend a person who does payroll to me that I could perhaps learn their job. <laughs> and, and he said, um, you know, what you want to do since, since I see the, the mess you're in, just, you, you want to call up UCLA and, and, and get a list of all, all the guys who teach payroll accounting and then call them up one by one, give them any name. They don't know who's in their fucking class. Um, and start asking questions until they stop answering them and then call the next guy. And I did this for two or three days and I made payroll. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking copious notes. Uh, because... <laughs> and, and so uh, I'm up there and, and Deborah, she hasn't made a deal with Teamsters. No, everybody drives their own truck, the key grip and the best boy they can drive the grip truck. Uh, the electricians, they wish they had a truck. They're sharing the grip truck. The camera department, they can work out of a van and anybody can drive a van. Um, the prop girl, she can have a van, you know, um, and, and that was the deal. So when the news came that Janet Lee was flying in for her cameo, somebody had to go to the airport and pick her up and, and my number got punched. So um, I get pulled out of my room doing the accounting, which I'm so happy to get pulled out of that room doing the accounting. <laughs> And, and given the keys to the station wagon and told, go to San Francisco International Airport, pick up Janet Lee. So um, I, did you ever see uh, the DeLuca picture, um, King of Hearts? It's one of my favorite films of all time. 
And the, the two staff sergeants run into the general's tent. And he says, I have an important mission. You have to leave immediately. They snap to salute and say, sir, yes, sir, and run out. And then about five seconds later, the camera doesn't move. They, they sheepishly creep back in. Um, where, where, where was it you wanted us to go, sir? <laughs> and and um, it, it, Jean-Vierre Bujol, Alan, Alan Bates, it's, it's one of the greatest films ever made, huh. King of Hearts. And I felt like I was in King of Hearts at this point because I, I knew where the airport was. I, I had worked um, for Cartan Travel and I'd run summer tours through um, Yosemite, San Francisco, um, up and down the, uh, the Gold Coast. Um, I, I, I knew California. What I didn't know is what Janet Lee looked like. <laughs> oh, no. I, I had seen Psycho in college. She wasn't the same age, didn't particularly have the same hairdo, and um, it must have walked past me a half a dozen times in the airport. And she didn't know who I was. Nobody told me to hold up a sign. I'm looking for her. She's looking for a guy with a sign. I don't have a sign. Um, so I, I get on the phone and I, and I have Janet Lee, Lee paged. <laughs> So she picks up the phone and I, I'm looking at her pick up the phone. I go, oh, yeah, Janet. And she's not amused. <laughs> no, I bet. I bet she's not. Yeah, and it was the kind of car uh, station wagon where um, if you looked at it, you would prefer to sit in the front seat. She intentionally sat in the back. <laughs> and and, and it, it, it was quite intentional. I knew I was Dutch and I, I knew apologies and, and, and said, you know, there's really no excuse for me um, not knowing what I don't know, but I apologize for not knowing what I don't know. <laughs> and, um, and, and then she says to me that she really has to go to the bathroom. So I pull over first exit immediately. First thing we see is Baskin and Robbins and they do not have public restrooms. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I worked at one. <laughs> and so, and I said, I said, excuse me, who's the manager here? Who's the manager here? And, and he identifies himself. I said, you may not recognize this, but this woman is Janet Lee. And she would like to use your bathroom, please. <laughs> She's a cook, started in the bathroom. And, and so now we come out of the bathroom and now Janet's sitting in the front seat. And so I think you know, I, I report to myself, um, I can always just work later into the night or earlier in the morning. Um, I can never really get ahead or behind of doing fucking books. And so um, I'm enjoying this time I'm spending with her. And she's telling me these outrageously great stories. Like um, she like just shares with me the fact that one of her most frustrating experiences was working with Hitchcock. We were talking about Psycho. And she says, all I could ever get out of the man was where the dolly was going to be when I said which word, and then I would stand up there so they could continue to track. And that wow. was the most direction he would ever give me, blocking direction for his, huh. for his camera. And, and she said that he had explained to her, uh, from her lips to my ears, that the reason for that was he had learned after his first or second or third picture that the game was all about movie stars. And movie stars were their own uh, uh, trademark, and they knew who they were more than anybody else knew who they were. So what he wanted to do was not mold them into a vision of anything. He wanted to work around what was bringing people to the box office to watch them perform and, and render a version of this initial vision around what they were bringing to the table. And so he wanted her to do her thing. She knew her fans. So I'm delighted in all of this. So I think I'm going to roll the dice. I, I knew from, from having run Cartan tours through San Francisco and staying there for three nights at a time, that one of everybody's favorite things to do for some crazy reason was to go to Fisherman's Wharf, get an Olympia canned beer and a shrimp cocktail and sit on the curb. So I drive to the parking lot at Fisherman's Wharf. I stop, I get two shrimp cocktails, two beers, and I tell Janet to come out and sit on the curb with me. And she did. And, um, and we became fast friends after that. I, I, that's where she told me the Hitchcock story and everything wow. was sitting on the curb there. Amazing. And, it's amazing. Yeah. And so um, after I finished up the fog as a production accountant, uh, Deborah Hill uh, offered me to be the accountant for her and John's production company, Hilltopper, which right. I did on a part time basis. And then I leveraged their offer of me to run their company, which I should have taken in hindsight, um, to get a, a job in the production department at Avco Embassy. Um, and, and, and that didn't work out well for me because Mr. Bob Ramey then brought in a guy from the, the exhibition circuit who had done him a favor on 
Edie Landau's picture, Hopscotch with Martin Landau. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they, they did distribution terms that were required. And long story short, um, he owed a rummy snitcher a favor. So if you can believe it, he hires a guy, pays him more than me and asks me to train him to replace me. And that was for an eye for an eye, correct? No, this was to be uh, an in-house position at New World. What had happened was I, I completed an eye for an eye as an assistant director. And okay. I was friends with um, Rob Keneally for some crazy reason very early in life. Um, we, we were both very young in our 20s. Like, I think he was maybe just graduating UCLA. <clears throat> and I was at APCO Embassy. And Rob was best, best friends with Frank Capra, number three. So mm -hmm. through that relationship, I met Frank Capra, number two. And he was trying to get a script that um, the girl who wrote Black Stallion, Jeannie um, uh, Rosenberg, um, had written, I think it's called Gold Coast or something. He was trying to get that made, and it was stalling. And so I suggested that I produce an eye for an eye since I, I found it. I, I was taking karate lessons at Chuck Norris's studio, um, which had been taken over by uh, June Chong. And one day Chuck walks in and I meet Chuck Norris right there in the studio I'm working out in. And I'm not a good person, but I'm, you know, I'm doing the work and taking the classes, trying to get better. And, and June, you know, always an opportunist said, Chuck, he works at Apco Embassy. And Chuck's like, you work at Apco Embassy? Now here's a guy who had just made the who had just made uh, good guys wear black. He had yeah. the octagon in the can, but not open, and that's the important part of the story. In the can, mm. but not open. And um, and he says to me, he can't get anybody to read his script. I for not. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to Bob Ramey. I I I I do special projects for Bob. He just asked me to do a director's list for him. I could see him anytime I want. I had met Bob because. My dad's advice working uh, at Avco for the first time was um, be the first guy in and the last guy out for the first year. He says, just commit yourself to that. And so um, after about two months there, uh, Bob Ramey, uh, who was literally he had keys to open the building. He was the chairman. Of the group, um, he said, who the fuck are you? So I see you here every morning. I, I don't know what department this is. I don't know why you're here. I don't know what's important you're doing. And I, I told him I just was ambitious and I wanted to be in production. I was going to produce movies. And he started to give me these assignments to do and everything. And so um, I gave Bob the script for an eye for an eye. And then I went off as the completion bond rep uh, for Escape from New York. So I'm in St. Louis signing checks on Escape from New York, having the time of my life. It, it's the easiest job in the world being a completion bond rep. All you're <laughs> doing is approving something that got completely developed eyeballed by everybody the director likes it the producer likes it it agrees with the budget you're just the, the last signature making it real no job in the world's easier than that and and i'm having the time of my life and i had just gone to a hellacious crew party and it's like four in the morning and the phone rings and it's bob Raymond. and and he says have you seen the overnights the fuck are overnight? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the numbers that we get from the movie theaters that are phoned into us from a subscription service, we as presidents and vice presidents of distribution have. <laughs> well, no, I don't know what the overnights are. <laughs> a force of one just cleaned up. How do I get a hold of Chuck Norris? I said, well, that's not hard. I got his number. He answers the call. <laughs> I mean, I was over at his house trying to do sit-ups with him the guy literally does a thousand sit-ups on a slant board i'm literally throwing up after 300 literally <laughs> and, and and you know i'm i'm, I'm just trying I'm, there's no way i'll ever be but you know i'm i'm there and participating and so um so i call up chuck he goes yeah let's do it and i call up jim bruner and he's excited to hell and then um I can't believe they hired Steve Carver, but they hired Steve Carver to direct it. Mm -hmm. And then and then they get the same production manager from Golden Girl, the guy who figured out how to steal everything for Danny O'Donnell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I said, you know, if I just ask for whatever I can get, something good will come out of it. And Capra sits down with me and goes, here's the thing. I've talked to Ramey. He says, Donald, I believe you could produce this movie. I've seen the things you do in life. Um, he's not going to let you do it. He says, what, what I think you should do is what I did. Before I became a producer, I first started as a second, second assistant director. And I learned all about how movie sets were, worked in Hollywood. Let me start you out there as second, second assistant director. 
And, and that was a great thing for everything except the third to the last day of the shoot where um, the first AD um, really needed to see a dentist and nobody was gonna fly a first AD in. And I didn't know how to be a second AD yet. And now they asked me to run the set. <laughs> We're doing squibs. That was the most nightmarish experience of my life to be put in charge of something that you didn't even know how it worked. And you're supposed to tell people and answer questions. Um, and yet I showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I, had, I had learned two things very early in life. Um, that if you don't want to argue with somebody, just, you know, look them square in the eye and say, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. You, you can usually stop everything. And, um, and if you don't know, ask for a recommendation. You know, so the wardrobe thing, do I need this ready in 20 minutes? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> right. And so right. now I know. I, now I know. Wardrobe's ready in twenty minutes. Write that down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, we struggled through the day and did not make the day. And, and the first AD had to come back and make it up. And, and the way we finally paid for my sins was the very last day of the show it was like some ungodly kind of like twenty-six hour workday or something. It, it it was crazy. I, I remember not having slept for two consecutive days in the last three days of the show. Wow. So, so, so when you, so you're working at AFCO NBC and you said it, it didn't end ultimately work out when you leave AFCO, that's when you started working for Sandy Howard. And that's when you decided to use that advice to, uh, to, yeah, maybe I, take... I, uh, yeah, I had, I had completely walked away and left and they found themselves about to do vice squad with Sandy Howard. And, um, and, and I was charged before I left with training my replacement. Well, I thought, well, if I train my replacement, well, then he's a trained replacement. If I have, have done what my father told me to do, he's, and his advice was generally, if, if you can extrapolate what I did from this, you're, then you're on my wavelength. Don't get really good at filing. <laughs> and, and I made it a point not to get really good at filing, but get really good at everything else. And so I had unique position there that was not replaceable in my mind. And I had relationships with all the producers. And I, I, was the, I was the bane of Dan Blatt's fucking existence on the Howling. I did mm. not know how to make a movie. And I was the check signer. And unlike Escape from New York, where everything was developed ahead of me and I was the last signature on the check, I was a very meaningful signature on the check. I was attesting to the fact that Dan was right. So I made him explain every decision he made to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good time. Yeah. <laughs> not for him right. just for me and, and take yeah. notes yeah. man did i learn how to produce a movie i bet so then, i bet it, and, and then working at the um completion bond co guarantor um the completion bond company the lindsley parsons senior ran that and as i would then bring the checkbook over with checks for him to counter sign when we were doing movies like the, night, the lights went out in georgia and he was the third signature on the ron maxwell movie i i had driven over there in a car i didn't particularly have to be back in 15 minutes i didn't have a clock anybody was stamping so when Lindsay was in the mo mood to light up a cigar and tell me how life was back at old republic studios with john wayne i, I listened mm. and it was it was really fun hearing how they made the old b movies and, and and what a trip would be for him to walk around the sets of the a pictures that just got shot with a screenwriter what what can we come up with and, and who are the b actors on payroll you know, and, and so now we got a B movie rolling out for the cost of stock because everybody else is working here anyway. Right. And, and it was great hearing all those stories. It really helped me uh, figure out how to do a lot of low budget B movie things along the way on, on, on my path. Sure. And, 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 so, and, so, and, and so I left and I had nothing to do. And they called me in and said, uh, you know, uh, Remy doesn't know what he's doing. We, we need to hire you freelance to um, be the check signer on Vice Squad with Sandy Howard. And I said, but you know, here's the thing, it'll cost you twice what I used to make. <laughs> and, so they, <laughs> and so they paid it. And, um, and so I, I started to work part-time making a lot more money than I was wow. making um, full-time. And then I became known as Captain Budget because one of the things that I did at Avco that I, could, I couldn't and wouldn't teach a Brummie to do was how to do a movie budget. And, and I knew how to do a movie budget by the time I had left Avco. I, I, while I was at, at Avco, I did the very first budget for Steve Jarnett's Miracle Mile when it was going to be a New World picture, and they wanted to know how much it cost. They gave it to me to tell them how much it cost. Um, it was going to be a it was going to be a New World. 
Miracle Mile? Excuse me. Excuse me. Avco Embassy. Oh, okay. Avco Embassy. okay. Yeah. Also at Avco Embassy, I had done the very first budget for um, Abrams Brothers Airplane. It was Bob Ramey uh, had a relationship and he was trying to convince the aviation guys to pick it up. But that was the damnedest thing. And I was guilty of it, too. When you when you just read the script, it was really hard to get that. It was funny. The, yeah. the performance, the performance is what makes Airplane sure. Airplane. Sure. If you recast that movie with like, you know, bad wannabe college actors, it's not that funny. Mm. The performances are Leslie Nielsen is a comic genius. Yeah, yeah. But it's the deadpan of it. it's the taking it all oh, so it's, seriously. It's all yeah. of it. And, and the right casting, Barbara Billingsley and who you know, and just everything. Um, and, and you also did the the Terminator budget, right? The initial budget for Terminator at that, that time. That was after I quit Avco and I was working freelance. Okay. I actually I actually bought my first house down payment on budget freelance budget money. I was making I did all the I had the Hemdale account. I had the part of the Avco Embassy account. I was doing Orion stuff, New World stuff. I was I was doing lots of budgets. Lots of I just get calls from agents saying, you know, my director said that you know he needs to turn in a budget to tell the distributor how much the movie will cost. And and my budgets were gold. They uh, I had a, re- a special relationship with film finances by that time, and also with every completion month company. If my name was the name who had prepared the budget, it was bondable. Hmm. So in working for Sandy Howard. That is what actually helps get you over to New World Pictures, correct? Because Sandy, as well as Roger Burledge. No, working for Sandy is what what helped me complete the knowledge, training, and confidence of, I believe, what they call the 10,000-hour rule. You do something for 10,000 hours, and, 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 buddy, where did it come from? I can actually do this. Right, right. Well, after after six months on Sandy Howard's desk, it felt like 10,000 hours, and, 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 (laughs) and... and he had sent me down um, to work for Derek Gibson to make uh, the third horse movie, Man Called Horse, in Mexico. And, and watching him put the deal together was like watching uh, a maestro conduct an orchestra. He, he had an ED plan from England that brought us the director, John Alcott, and Derek Gibson as a producer. Um, he had a, uh, a European financing plan that... that I can't even explain, but it had to do with Spain making a claim on a British fund and then hiring the script supervisor who, who did um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Margarita Padro Robles was actually good. Juan Cuki Lopez was our first AD. He, one of the greatest first ADs to ever be a first AD. His, his, his resume is magnificent. And two or three uh, Spanish actors and then he had foreign pre-sales and we had a bank loan and, and Hemdale was, was doing financing. And as it turns out, Derek Gibson had um, in, in, in a non-unusual John Daly fashion, his, his partner, they, they were partnering on Hem, Hemdale. Uh, Derek was, was, re, was coming as the number two guy on this picture. They really wanted John Huff. So they had made it seem to John that he was directing a $10 million movie that had eight and maybe more weeks of production if he needed it we were doing a million and a half dollar movie that had four weeks straight up get it or lose it and now um, i'm in the room while derek's telling john for the first time hours after he's got off the plane john becomes apoplectic and, and i believe fisticuffs are on the precipice of occurrence without wow. a doubt until Derek actually spits up blood like the fucking exorcist. And wow. what had happened was the pure stress of holding the deal together, which, you know, sometimes producers get in that point where if this deal doesn't go, I'm going to lose my house. I can't pay off my loans. I can't do this. I'll, I won't get the next job, everything. Will... And Derek was in one of those deals where he had to have John Huck direct this movie and, and he didn't tell the guy and he lied to him. So now, now, as it turns out, what Derek had was a completely ruptured, um, bleeding ulcer, and he was uh, going to die. I picked him up, carried him to a taxi. I had already known from my advance that the difference between the American so-called hospital um, and the other hospital. I took him to the so-called American hospital in Mexico City, and, and, and I stood next to him. Uh, until um, we got into the emergency room, which is minutes after we checked in, no paperwork being done. And they fully understand what's happening. And, and it wasn't 10 minutes I was out of the cab and I'm seeing them take a hand drill and drill 
you know, where you hold your hand on top and you use a clockwise motion, drill into his stomach and then stick a tube then to start to drain the blood. Wow. And I, I saved his life. And, uh, and then I went back and, and suggested to John that, um, that I would fully understand if he left the movie, I would just appreciate if he would tell me right now, because I'm a fully capable producer and I will have a director on this set tomorrow morning. I just want to know if it's him. And he really wanted director Western <laughs> and he kind of liked my style. And I, sure. had, I don't know if you know, Terry Leonard, he's a this big stunt coordinator and, um, he like did Raiders and, and right. And, and, oh yeah. And I made it a point to have Terry standing behind me <laughs> when I was saying, <laughs> to, <laughs> sure. To, to John. And, 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 and we did the best we could with what we had. At one point, the stuntmen thought that they could hold us up for ransom and they came in and asked for have their wages tripled or they would be on the next plane out of town. And I said, it's going to be interesting how you all are going to do that since I'm holding some of your return tickets, but I'm calling the bluff on this. You show up for your contract tomorrow or you're off the show and I'm not giving anybody any more tickets. They were all out of town. I cashed in a couple of their tickets and, um, and I was the sub number three at the water hole. Julio McCott, who went on to shoot Home Alone, was um, thug number two. Doug O'Neans, who was the camera operator for all the Stanley Kubrick movies. And, and he was John Alcock shooting our picture as well. And, and uh, he, he was one of the bad guys, at one of the toughs. And, and I just cast them all into the crew. And, and we filled in for all the stuntmen and we finished the movie. And, and so from there, is that where you go from there to New World Pictures then? Well, no, what had happened next was I was then unemployed and freelanced. And uh, one of my very, very best friends, just from knocking around town and playing pool, um, had got a gig for the first time. He went from college to being a stock boy to finally getting on. And, and it was at, a, at um, an advertising company called uh, Lou Jump. And Lou Jump produced the Lucky and Jumbo commercials that you used to see. Um, <laughs> Bone Eyes Ribeye Steak this week, four ninety nine. Come to Lucky, you know that. And there was some <laughs> lady holding her hands up and all that kind of stuff. And sure. they'd knock maybe ten or twenty of them out in a day. And because of my work on um, an eye for an eye, he got me on one day's worth of twenty Lucky Lou Jump commercials. But I met so many ad people, and they all got my phone number. I was making commercials as a first AD. For just about a month, I got maybe four or five of them, and then I caught a Bond commercial. I'm doing this big thing for Dentsu with Roger Moore. Um, what is it? The 805, the, the North, the, the, the East West Freeway, the, the one, the, the one that's like Simi Valley East West was being built. It, it was okay. the 80s, and, okay. and and we got we got a permit to use the whole thing. So we're doing high speed chases and drops and falls from cars and. And I'm, I'm putting, renting the Biltmore Hotel and putting high fall bags out in the parking lot and everything. And, and this Japanese crew is, is crazy. They got, um, they, they got these overworked working conditions. They fly out from Japan and they know they're going to work a 20 hour day. They have these, um, what are the pills that make you go? Amphetamines, the ones that make you, you and, and they dream. would, I don't know the name of it, but they're pills sure. and, right. and, 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 and they, they're like, like, potent cocaine uh caffeine <laughs> kind of thing right yeah and, but, yeah and i don't used know to, but, used to sell like gas pres- stations and stuff yeah but but no these were prescription oh, and, oh okay and, no these are heavy duty serious shit okay and and, and so mm-hmm. you'd see like the, the assistant cameraman and he would have like three of them on his shoulder like one two three and then um as he would start to be nodding he, he would take one and, and, and take it and like three or four hours later, he would take another one and take it. I mean, there wasn't that much motion going on, I guess, or whatever. But um, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. And, and so uh, I have t- one day left to finish and I get a phone call and it's Silvio Tibet. And he had just got off the phone with Sandy Howard. And he was um, about two weeks away from filming The Beastmaster. Almost all of the pre-production had been done. And his cinematographer, John Alcott, had said, either you get Sandy Howard to come on board and straighten out this production, or I am walking with my camera crew. And Sandy said that there's no way with his slate of pictures or, or with the deals that he's looking to do that we could marry. But he knew I was looking for work. And, and he said that, um, that he would vouch for the fact that I could certainly do this. Uh-huh. And, 
and it was quite challenging. I, I, I was on the picture. My very first day was the day after Thanksgiving. And it was after 82, 81, 82, whichever year that was. And it was torrential downpour. And I, I'm like doing things like taking my um, scotch tape dispenser from my home box and putting it on my desk, you know, and, and figuring out who works here and, and, and just generally starting my first minutes at work. And the transportation coordinator comes in and he says, you know, that pyramid we're building out in Simi Valley. And I, nope. <laughs> and he says, well, we're building, we're building a pyramid out in Simi Valley and it's the centerpiece of the show and it's pretty fucking big and everything takes place there. I go, Roger that. And he says, well, uh, we can't access it because our dirt road is now a mud quagmire. Mm -hmm. I said, solution. I said, recommend a solution. And because like I said, I got trained a long time ago. You don't have to know anything. You just have to know how to run things. Sure. So I said, recommend a solution. And he says, well, the only thing to do is to gravel in a road. I said, well, if that's the only thing to do, then we got to do the only thing we can do, don't we? <laughs> right. And, and he said, well, we, yeah. And he couldn't believe how logical I was. <laughs> for six months in pre-production with these people, which is how they ended up with the dirt road. <laughs> It wasn't like he hadn't discussed that more. And so um, he says, uh, how, how are we going to pay for this? I said, I can't tell you for sure, but I got the script and the, the production board. Oh, my executive producer is there about 30 minutes later. Apoplectic. $30,000 for a gravel road. We can't afford this. I said, so you can't afford the opportunity loss of shutting down. That's what you can't afford. Right now we have a production that hasn't even started filming yet. We haven't spent any money yet. So let me save $30,000 that hasn't been fucking spent yet. He said, well, how do you propose to do that? I said, well, you know, I've only been on the show a few minutes, but you, you were kind enough to let me spend my Thanksgiving reading your script and reviewing your production schedule. And I said, the first thing I'll tell you is what I see you're proposing to shoot today. You're proposing to have 70 people on payroll with 50 people in a model department next door watching a ferret climb up a rope as your first six setups. I said, so that's not going to happen. He says, what do you mean? I said, I've already told the first AD. I, I said, you've got to call in actors and shoot scenes where actors talk today. And, and, and Silvio says, well, you, you can't just do that. I said, well, you know, I can if you want me to produce the movie. And so um, I did. And, and then I uh, spent the next two days pulling all the scenes with animals off of first unit and scheduling them onto what we call second unit. Second unit. Yeah, sure. Like everybody who went to film school knows, and, and I didn't even go to film school because I got a full refund. And so, um, <laughs> so it's such a good story. <laughs> yeah. and, and I knew it. So uh, sure. so now so now I'm all settled in. I'm over my problem with Silvio. I've got everything. Uh, this wasn't our first day of photography, but but this was me saying to them how the first day of photography was going to change in a week and a half when we started shooting. And so um, it's lunch is done and I've met the accountant who I'm getting ready to fire and replace based on the fact that I can smell the fucking booze on his breath and it's lunchtime and I'm not making this up. And so well, I brought in get Sometimes lunch Gary, gets away from you and you know. It... <laughs> let, let me say Rip Torn drank every lunch hour. And after watching him interact with Don Coscarelli, I can't say which one was right and which one was wrong because this story illuminates everything. So John Alcott comes to me after lunch and he says, um, Donald, I, I don't have confidence this show can be made. And, and I said, why do you say that? It looks like they got 12 weeks and, and all the right pieces. And, and he says, um, the director, I've asked him for a shot list over and over and over again. He won't give me a shot list. I don't have a shot list for any sequence for any day. I'm in pre-production. This is what I'm supposed to be doing right now is starting to visualize. I, I, I have a shot list. I can see the equipment needs, the crew needs, how much pre-light, how much striking. But if I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, let me get to the bottom of this. And so I go into to Don Coscarelli's office and I meet him for the first time. What a nice guy. And mm -hmm. I'm like in awe of him. I worked at Avco Embassy when we had Phantasm and I saw the numbers. And, and, and I knew that um, going in, because uh, Sandy had explained to me that the sales contracts and the show demanded that he was an irreplaceable element. If Don didn't direct and finish this movie, they didn't have to buy it. 
and they wanted a Don Coscarelli picture. That's what the, that was, was being bought and sold. And I understood that from day one. That was going on. So I said, Don, I'm, I'm just, you know, not going to mince any words here. And um, I put two X's on a piece of paper and I drew a circle around it. And then I, I drew a line arbitrarily through the center of it. And I said, show me your camera positions to get a master and two close ups. And he crossed the line. And 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 I said, now, do you appreciate the fact that you just crossed the line? Now, I, I never went to film school, but I had all of these real world experiences at AFCO Embassy. I was on like 30, 40 movies that never got made and a couple dozen that got made. And after it was over, I kept working as a consultant for them. So I had seen that Norman Lear had financed a movie. This is so long ago. Don't ask me the name of it, but you can look it up. The reason okay. why they can't. The reason why they canceled the movie after the second day of production and never picked up again was because they're looking at dailies where, where in the close-ups, all of the actors are speaking left to right. Right. And they, they're crossing the line. Because they didn't know what a line was or right. that you crossed. They, they, they got to direct a movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. And so and so I knew exactly what crossing the line was. I saw a movie get canceled over crossing the line and I knew how to ask about a line. And, and I saw that he didn't know what that was. Mm. And so um, I thought about it and thought about it, thought about it. And, 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 and I know I know that I do my best decision making if I sleep on it. And so I spent the rest of the afternoon in post-production and I met the fabulous Roy Watts. Now, here they had hired the editor who had done the Harryhausen pictures. So I'm walking onto a show. It already has, if you read this, John fucking Alcott shooting it, Roy fucking Watts cutting it, and Jim Spardalotti and Richard Graves running the set. You cannot mm -hmm. get better ADs than Jim Spardalotti and Richard Graves, two of the best ADs to ever be ADs. And right. Tom Hamill that comes on, that goes on to become one of the leading line producers at Fox, is my production manager. I've got, I got all the right pieces. What, what, what do I need to do to make sure this will happen? And I wake up the next morning and I go back to Roy Watts' um, editing room. And I said, have you ever thought about directing a movie? He said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, have you ever like, given thought to like, what if somebody asked me to direct a movie? And he sheepishly admits that he has. I said, let's, let's talk about this, this action scene. I said, how would you cover it? And, and we talked about that for a few minutes. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to start every day on the set in a meeting with John Alcott and Don Costello. And you are going to be the person who records the shot list for the day. It will then be distributed to the first assistant director from you. If Don doesn't give you a shot list, write a fucking shot list. Believe me, he will not let you write a fucking shot list. <laughs> right. So now I go back to Don to try and finish out the puzzle of why this is such a monumental task. And, and we have a very calm discussion. And I learned for the first time something that I had never known. Phantasm was shot over the course of maybe six or eight months, months, months. Mm. And they thought they were so clever. And everybody knew this trick. Back when you used to have to rent cameras and it was really expensive, what happens was you'd have a price you would pay per day. But let's say you're doing a six-week show. Will you negotiate the number of days in a week? So you don't pay a seven-day week. If you're an idiot, you pay a five-day week because you're not using it on the weekends. If you start to figure out how to negotiate, it's a two-and-a-half or three-day week. And, and then you're like a production manager who knows the, the state of deal making back in the 80s. And so um, the other trick you knew is that if you had to do pickup shots, if you, if you check the camera out on a Friday morning, you could be using it in the afternoon all day Saturday, all day Sunday, most of Monday morning, and return it Monday afternoon for the price of one day rental. Where if you did it in the middle of the week, you'd have to pay a, day, a half a day prep, a day shoot, and a half a day wrap. If you picked it up on a Friday. So you'd get three full days of shooting out of a one day rental. So that's what they did for Phantasm. And they were so proud of themselves. <laughs> and, 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 what, and what they did was they would then edit their work on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then the editor would suggest with the director, um, these would be neat shots. And then they'd go back and shoot them the next weekend. <laughs> right. And, and they, they didn't have sets that they didn't control. They didn't have actors they didn't control. I mean, everything was controllable and they could get away with it. Well, I mean, we've got a window on Tanya Roberts. We've got a window on Mark Singer. We've got yeah. a director of photography that wants to light the set. And, then, and when I say light the set, as it turns out, 
we used Fuji ASA 400, pushed it to 500, and, 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 excuse me, pushed it two stops and set it to 500. And then instead of lighting, all those night sequences are the actual bonfires and the close-ups are, are um, flagged sun guns. So the actors can walk into um, places where their faces get lit. Those are just sun guns buried. We never wow. rented a generator. Wow. We did the same thing on Vice Squad. And that's why I knew we could do it. On Vice Squad, we did the same trick, but um, he additionally did um, a wet down of the streets where you pick up one and a half to two stops of, of light just from wetting the streets down that are heavily lit with streetlights. Right. So I've come to realize that Don Coscarelli doesn't have a prayer of doing a shot list without a lot of support. That before I ever got there, they put together the greatest support team you could ever have supporting a support team. All mm-hmm. I had to do was make them use them. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, and so um, I made them use them and, and they did. And they, we had a shot list every day for the first AD and we had a movie and, and, um, and Roy Watts edited it. And I remember there was a lot of discussion about the script being 86 pages. So I had it timed and it timed out to something like three and a half hours. And a lot of that, you know, the Marines attack Iwo Jima stuff. And Silvio didn't believe me. I kept saying, Silvio, we can cut a lot of stuff. I mean, we, I, I tell you, we can save money by not only opening up second unit, but we can cut this, we can cut this. It's just, you're going to cut it later because we're running late. And um, even after all of my cuts, which brought us in on schedule in my second unit, the Roy's first assembly came in over three hours. Wow. You, you could do two hours just on Chuck Bale's second unit director's coverage of the, the Junes attack the Emors, in no which the village on sticks. Yeah. He, he, sh- he shot enough that you could make a whole movie out of it. He, he, that man loved directing. <laughs> wow. And, and, and when he found out that we would pay for the film. <laughs> yeah, he was like, he, like a kid in a candy store. Just like, oh, so many options. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because he wasn't limited by a stunt budget. Because being a stunt man, getting to direct second unit and really wanting to really showcase himself. He hired his own crew. And when he needed more, they got what the piggy bank had and not a penny more. I mean, he huh. shot stuff we didn't need. I mean, he did. Sure. But, but man, did he shoot stuff. It's crazy amount of footage. Wow. Yeah, so, so, so after I finished that, um, then I went back working for Sandy doing budgets again. And then, then I got the phone call from Roger Burlidge, who I had d- reported directly to at New World. Um, he's the guy sure. that got me the, the gig at, at um, The Fog. Um, he said, um, we're looking at this uh, movie that... Um, the New York financiers, um, uh, I think they're the Schusters, Howard Schuster. And he had a movie that he was doing with Bill Gilmore, who was a producer that Sandy Howard had introduced me to. So I knew Bill quite well. And uh, Bill produced uh, White Knights in a lot of great movies. And so uh, I said, what's going on, Bill? And, and, and he says, well, you know, we're, we might have to go into bankruptcy. We're doing Rock and Roll Hotel in 3D with... Um, Oh, that rock and roll singer. I'm hard pressed to think of her name. And he showed me the dailies and they were awesome. The photography was point on, the art direction was point on, the cast was eclectic. Um, and, and the girl was a famous pop singer. I'm just so bad with names at this point in my life. So uh, I, I uh, was competing then at this point for... Um, Roger had just come on to New World and they were going to hire a head of production. And he says to me, do a good job on this and I'll get your, your hat in the ring to, to run production at New World. And so I thought, OK, the, the gauntlet's been put down. I'll, I'll give this everything I have. I'll, I'll put together what would be the forefront of a PowerPoint presentation, but without the PowerPoint. It was uh, two three ring notebooks that were five inches each. And, and as you open it up, the first part was the shooting script. The second part was scenes completed. The third part was scenes uncompleted. The fourth part was a statement of the director's vision of what he needed to do to complete a version of the movie. The next part was, if there was less money available, a shorter version could be done this way. I then had a budget, a shooting schedule. I had resumes for the crew. I had everything backed up. I had letters from the bond company that was bondable. And then I had a final opinion after having done all of this research. I said, but here's the real problem. You don't know if everybody's telling you the truth and people could come out of the woodwork. I said, so I want us to buy this film, but I want us to buy it the same way we we bought Bill Richards' Winter Kills 
over it at Avcal Embassy. I want this to go in and out of Chapter 13 bankruptcy, and I want to get it after a bankruptcy court says affirmed, assets moved, no liens. And they, they bought my recommendation top to bottom with all of my support. And we lost the movie because we didn't move. Somebody else picked it up, but I think it was the right decision. And, and so then I got on New World and, and I immediately brought in uh, the Chuck Norris movie and I, for, excuse me, MIA. And check this out. I've got, I've got a Philippine deal, which is going to cover like more than half and as much as two thirds of the budget to shoot it in the Philippines under this, this, uh, the government was giving away money. Marcos was doing some crazy things at the time and, and movies were getting made and this money was being used. And Lance Hendrickson was doing a lot of these deals. So I, I had this deal. Um, I had Chuck. Chuck brought it to me directly. And, um, and Harry Sloan was working closely with the HBO startup guys uh, purchasing division. And, and we knew we could get the movie covered. And some Yahoo inside the company just said... Uh, no, I, I don't know if it's going to work. It's a fucking Chuck Norris action movie. I, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> so did, was it that he just didn't, was it the deal that he didn't think would work or he just didn't really like well, the, the concept? At the, at the time, Harry Sloan's partner, Larry Cuppin, fancied himself um, uh, that guy that uh, William Goldman in Adventures of the Screen, screen Trade said doesn't exist. The, the guy who knew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The man with the yeah, golden right, touch. Right. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's the same guy who, when Len Hill brought us a picture that was 90% covered with the CBS presale starring fucking Tom Hanks in a comedy, he knew not to do that one too. <laughs> Which one was that? Was that Bachelor Party? No, um, this movie never got made. Um, oh. Uh, to Tommy Lee Wallace was going to direct, Tom Hanks was starring, um, Len Hill was producing. Uh, these a comedy team, Miller. I can't remember their names off the top of my head. I'm so bad with names. They did the script, and it was a takeoff on The Exorcist. Um, I can't remember the name, but I, I'll give you an example of a scene. A guy's trying to sell um, the Amityville house, you know, and, and he okay. doesn't want to admit it's the Amityville house. So you know, like they they walk in, and the first thing you see is the tape marks of the dead body on on the wood floor. You know, and he pulls a carpet over it, you know, that kind of jokes. Sure, and, sure. Um, and, and, you know, when they get to the family room, you, you, you see the image of a person having run through play class, you know, and, and he pulls the curtains, you know, those kind of jokes. Sure, sure. And, and um, but I got to say it, it would have worked. And, and with the numbers coverage from CBS, uh, there was no reason not to make that movie. It, some people. Yeah. So, <laughs> so to be clear, this is this is now you at New World uh, Pictures. Yeah, this is me at New World. They turned down both my Chuck Norris offerings. Then I, I brought them back. The same the same team that we we made an eye for an eye. Yoram Ben Ami, the first AD. Steve Carver directing inexplicably again, and uh, Chuck Norris uh, starring. And I had Orion on as a partner, and New World w declined the offering, and Orion just made the the movie with others i put that deal together and and and, and you are better me um got the benefit of it oh, okay wow it's good by the way a nice a nicer guy you couldn't ask for he's the guy that literally trained me how to work a set on an eye for an eye mm. he, he could have bounced me off after two days saying no give yeah. me somebody who knows what they're doing and he didn't i mean i i, I was forever in his debt i was happy to see him get the gig oh that's great so, yeah. so when you go into New World Pictures at this point, you you brought the Angel script with you too. That you that had come about, I think, during your days with Sandy Howard, right? Because they they ended up producing the movie too. I had left Angel with Sandy and a um, a, a, a producing um, profit deal where if it got made, I got paid, and and if it got distributed, I got a back end. But I I had I had thought I had left the project. What, what had happened was I was going out. Um, with a, a young woman who worked in the accounting department at Africa Embassy uh, when I left. And, and we continued our relationship for a couple of years. And, and I started talking about you know marriage and I realized things like, I really don't like country and Western music and that's all she listens to. And <laughs> she, she, she's, she's really never been to quit, quit smoking and nicotine is the most foul smell I can ever imagine. But the, the real breaker was having gone to Notre Dame and, and her never having attended college. 
was was adamant about the fact that our children would not go to a Catholic university. And, and I said, well, what if we raise them Jewish and then, and then they go to a Catholic university? No, our children would never go. But even at that, the deal breaker was she wanted to call our firstborn male son Angel, and she was sure of it. And I had suggested that if she watched a few Humphrey Bogart movies, she might realize that that's the name of a fucking hooker. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she said, no, it's a beautiful Spanish name. And, and so I said, um, and we're having this argument. And literally the next morning, Sandy gives me one of his famous, you know, 5 a.m. phone calls because he called the world when he was attempting his morning bowel movement. <laughs> and um, every call he needed, he was going to be on the throne for two or three hours. So he made all his calls. <laughs> and, uh, and and so I was apparently first up that day. And he says, I've got this, this treatment that Robert o Vincent O'Neill and Joe Calla just gave me called Hollywood Star. It's three pages and I can tell it's a winner. And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll be over for lunch because um, um, he had food in the fridge. I could always make a ham sandwich if I went to Sandy's. That was a guarantee. You might not get paid, but you could get fed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I went over, made a ham sandwich, read, read the three-page treatment, and, and said, um, I, I, I want to do this, but I think we should call it Angel. I, I wanted to go home that night and tell my girlfriend that I was making a story about a hooker. <laughs> and win this and, debate <laughs> yeah and, and and as soon as i said that sandy lit up and he said oh oh don that's perfect that's the name and then and then he pulls out the tootsie poster and he says don't you see what what they did here with tootsie they have him this way by day and this way by night and tootsie he says, I was never happy Hollywood star because I want to rip off the Tootsie poster. I want to have her a uh, high school honor student by day and a Hollywood hooker by night. And Sandy knew that when he read the three pages. He was, he was a salesman like nobody could sell. And, um, and he says, but changing the name to Angel, that, that makes everything work. Yes, 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 yes. You're perfect for this. So then we had to, to get a script going. And I remember my, my major contributions we're talking about uh, the fact that Rocky had dramatic incidents. I said, he didn't just eat breakfast. He cracked six eggs into a glass and drank it in front of us. I said, we have to have things that have theatrical height. So based on that one conversation within five minutes, we came up with the whole gag where the boys would find her on the corner. And then the one guy would pee himself because she had a gun. And, okay. um, and then Joe Calla um, hung his hat on at the midpoint, I want the hunter to become the hunter. And, and that's when we did the whole uh, gag with the gun, which I talk about on my um, YouTube channel, the, the fact that Cliff Gorman actually brought a live gun to the set. He wanted Donna Wilkes dead that day. Yeah, that you is can hear such the whole a, story on my pot on my, my my video. Yeah, that yeah, definitely check out uh, Donald's uh, YouTube page and see that. It is a crazy story. I cannot believe that that that, that was the situation. Apparently, the animosity between the two lead actors and nobody had any idea of that history. Unbelievable. Yeah, so I was over at New World and I wasn't even looking for a project, which was so sad because the very first call I got is head of production. And, and in the same way, I couldn't recognize Janet Lee by face. I did not in 1984, or, excuse me, 1983, February, whatever it was, know the name Cornell Wilde. Just wasn't on my radar. I, I had never seen a Cornell Wild picture and knew of it. And I get this very sad phone call from this man who identifies himself as Cornell Wild, and he's willing to make me an offer that's unbelievable. He's willing to cut his star salary down to whatever, blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah. And, and I'm like, who is this? You know? <laughs> and so I, I, I took a meeting with him, and, and, and it was so embarrassing that he had to explain what a huge star he was to this asshole, me. Who I, I wasn't, I didn't come at this as a film buff or a film historian. At the time I was 21 years old, I hadn't seen 50 movies. I, I, I took one film study class in undergraduate and I saw 12 important films. And, and Cornell sadly wasn't in one of them. 
And so what I was spending most of my time on was actually uh, setting up forms. I wanted a budget form. I wanted a day out of days breakdown form. I wanted a um, call sheet, a production report. Roger Corman didn't leave us with anything. And, right. Then um, it wasn't the offices like pretty much just like, you know, paper clips on the floor and just like everything yeah. kind of abandoned. <laughs> exactly. It took the desks. We, we had to rent furniture. Wow. Um, and this it, is on San Vicente, us, right? The office, the yeah. old offices. Yeah. Over the Irish bar. Um, he, he owns the building. So uh, he made us rent from him. He was our landlord. <laughs> wow. And you're only there for a, a certain amount of like a few months. <laughs> and then you guys moved to another location. Correct? You know, Roger was was a terrible negotiator. And Roger would have been infinitely <laughs> more wealthy if he paid for people who had expertise in business to work for him along the way. Mm. And so he he thought he had New World by the balls because of the deal he negotiated. But New World just looked at the fine print. And after six months, we can move. So, yeah, we'll sign this deal in six months, we move. So I'm spending all my time doing that. And, I, and, and David Simpkins uh, walks up to me and says, I found the script in the closet. It's a Stephen King script. Right. And I said, and I said, oh, okay, what do you think? He says, I like it and everything. And I said, I don't know. I, I don't know if we have any money. Nobody's asked me to generate any projects here. I, I'm, I'm still just responding to packages. Like I have this Chuck Norris thing that's got money on it. I says, you think got any money on it? He's no, it's just, just a project. I think I'll make money. And I said, well, you know, what? I duly noted, David, duly noted. And, and so um, everything's kind of rolling, rolling around. And, and now Angel's uh, going forward because, uh, because Harry Sloan could do a pre-sale with HBO that virtually paid for the movie. And, and he could do this because at the time in that year, when it came out day and date, the Brandon Tartikoff uh, release of Little Ladies of the Night on NBC became the highest rated TV movie of all time. This is pre-Star Wars. Okay. And at the time in, in 83, it was still up there way in the top 10. So Brandon hears that Brandon and Harry were, were tight buddies. He hears that Harry's going on Angel and he makes a preemptive offer to buy the whole movie out for $4 million. We're making it for a million and a half. And, and that's how Harry and Larry bought their New World. They, they did some, um, um, who is that little guy on, on, on uh, that they represent? Yeah, they did a movie with uh, Gary Coleman. Gary Col they did three with Gary Coleman, but the first one, they were paid $2 million, but only spent 800000 never told Gary, kept the money and used it to buy New World with, Harry, uh, with Larry Thompson. Wow. And that's, and that's how they made the money on that, keeping, keeping the, the, owning the production company and keeping the big on the, on the uh, network license. That, that was so, called uh, uh, Jimmy the Kid, I believe. That was the that, movie. That was the made. movie. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, Jim Begg produced it. Yeah. And so, um, so, so uh, lost my train of thought. We were ba basically how you were bringing Angel along at New World. Oh, right, right, right. So, so Harry had had this covered from HBO. Um, we had the movie in the can, and New World was getting ready to tee up its second production because of this lucrative relationship that Harry had with Judy, uh, what's her name, over at HBO. And okay. she was, again, willing to provide a pre-sale for John Daly's The Howling, either two or three. Um, I, I had actually done the budget for that as a freelancer at one point in time. Um, Philippe Moro directed it. And, um, and, 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 and the thing that I was sure about from knowing John Daly intimately well and, and having made a promo for him, I, I tried to do a, a Woody Allen, What's Up Tiger Lily for him called um, Ten Zen Men. And uh, where we would recut Japanese movies and then re re revoice them. Sure, and, sure. And and based on that, I met Ken Scove and I created uh, the LA Connections run into improvisational uh, film comedy, uh, and I called it a filmed in improvisation cam, in, in, impro, improv cam. I forget what I called it. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's how we we tried to sell Ten Zen Men, and then and then Kent went off and, and did it as live stand up after that. But they really wanted to go on 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 the. Um, the howling and, and i said you, you know you remember roger you sent me into danny o'donovan and elia castner and, and you said to me shake his hand count your fingers and i'm telling you john daly shake his hand count your fingers and he says well what do you want to do i said well i don't know except that we have a horror film in house and david simpkins found it and it's called children of the corn and roger said can you take it for the same price 
and 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 Roger's the guy that that taught me how to do a budget. And and so it's funny that he would ask me that question because this is how he told me to do a budget. Mm-hmm. He says, you meet with your salespeople and you get a, a best case, a worst case, and a most probable case of sales in every market, foreign, home video, theatrical, prisons, trailers, oil rigs, churches, whatever. <laughs> and, 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 and you add it all together and then you run these numbers, subtract your distribution fee, subtract your distribution expenses, subtract your cost of production, subtract your cost of interest. Now, take that number and reserve 10% as a contingency and take that final number. And if you can make a movie for that number or less, it's safe because we've started with the worst case scenario. This, this, and, and this is how Jason Blum actually ran his whole business plan to start. Wow. Yeah. Because his number, by the time the, the business grew, it grew into a number of 5 million. And he had figured out at 5 million, we come out if it never opens theatrical, but just our foreign sales and, and video and everything. And so based on that, we greenlight. Um, oh, and, and one other very important thing. Uh, David Simpkins had been writing letters to Stephen King at the time Stephen right. was writing to people. So Stephen, so David had a letter from Stephen that said, yeah, make the movie. Yeah, let's do it. And so, so I went in and said, I, I'd rather do corn than, than this. And, and then they let me put it together. I offered it to Tommy Lee Wallace um, and he turned it down because of the script and, and told me later in life there was a huge mistake. It would have changed his life. And um, those people that I was doing the Lucky Gemco commercials for was uh, Fritz Kirsch and Terry Kirby. Right, right. So I, I went back to them as a return favor. Um, they helped me when I needed help and I had something I could hand out now. So I went back to them and said, you guys want to come on and produce, co-produce and, and direct a movie with me? And they said, yeah, let's do it. And, and, and then, then on Angel, I did one of the smartest things I ever did in my life. I, I had to hire a casting director. It was on me. And uh, Sandy said, get whoever you want. And and I didn't have a want. I didn't have a relationship with a single casting director. So I called up 10 of the most influential friends I had at the time. Uh, Rob Keneally, Greg Sims. um, I can't remember everybody I called, but I asked them all to give me a list of, of, of their 10 best casting directors, no matter what their price was or, or their fame just that they're that good. And there was only one name on all 10 lists and it was near the bottom of every one of the lists. And I said, well, this is the perfect person for me. Everybody thinks she's great. She hasn't had a mark yet in life. And let me repeat, everybody thinks she's great. Let me be the guy that steps up and, and makes her the number one person. So I met Linda Francis. Now, Linda, Linda was trained by Gordon Hunt at the Taper Forum. Hmm. Wow. Gordon Hunt trained Helen Hunt growing up. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Her, her dad, yeah. right? And, yeah. Before I directed my first movie, Linda made me take Gordon's acting class. And she said, if, if you're going to talk to actors, then you should learn how they speak. Mm-hmm. Go, ta- go learn the language. And, and so I, 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 it was a great experience. I, I'm taking Gordon's acting class, sit, sitting in between Quinn Cummings and Helen Hunt, having the mm. time of my life. So, so we get children of the corn made, and then um, and I you had an, you had an, a terrific cast. Just on that note, um, incredible cast in that, uh, and a lot of people that, of course, were about to blow up, such as Linda ha- Linda Hamilton, Peter Horton, and not only that, you also got John Franklin and Courtney Gaines uh, to play the, the the children, and 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 she was instrumental in in getting those, uh, obviously was, getting that cast. She was everything on every one of my movies. She was my cast on Angel, on Children of the Corn, on Crimes of Passion, on Vamp, on Tough yeah. Turf. Linda Francis cast those movies in, 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 in the same way that I said to the transpo guy, what should we do? I would say to Linda, who should play this? Um, if we could go back real quickly to Children of the Corn. Now, you found the, um, the script in the uh, old offices. Does that mean- David that- Simpkin. David Simpson. Right, David, comes. right. We, we just talked to David and he told us about the story about how, how he found it. But I'm wondering, did, did the old regime of New World, were they at all interested in it? Or I mean, I would think not because they dumped it in a closet. Do you happen to know well, if they we, were thinking we, about it? We, we actually inherited in my department one pers- key personnel from the old New World machi- machine. And I'm, I'm going to be hard pressed to remember her name, but she, she was our head of development 
inherited. I, I want to say her name was Carolyn, but I'm guessing. Um, okay. Roger Corman could really pick talent. And you could see that from all the directors he started and all the actors he started. She was right. no exception. She had advanced literary degrees from from higher learning institutions and literature and the arts. And, and, and she, she was very, very smart. And, and she had explained that the last few years working with Corman, scripts were getting made for different reasons. Like, for instance, Billy the Kid, he, uh, Jimmy the Kid, he distributed, but he didn't have a nickel in the production. And he was looking for, um, they call it OPM, other people's money. <laughs> right. he, was, he was looking for OPM deals at the time. <laughs> Sure. And, and so corn wasn't going to come together as an OPM deal. Got it. Okay. And so, and also when you were, you know, I know you obviously went with Fritz and you knew him from the commercial world doing the Gemco commercials, but, but before that you also, uh, there was an idea to have Sam Raimi direct it. Oh yes. That was um, Harry, Harry Sloan's first choice. And he set up an, an immediate meeting. He said, uh, what, what do you think about um, Sam Raimi directing it? So I, I, I ran out and that was the most brilliant thing about being head of production at, at New World. And all, if I wanted to watch a movie, all I had to do was fill out a form and then uh, a, a 35 millimeter print appeared in a screening room that I was noticed at the time. And I would walk into a screening room and, and by myself watch a 35 millimeter screening of anything I wanted whenever I wanted. Hmm. And so um, I went and watched um, Evil, Evil Dead, was it? Um, almost immediately. Yes. And, and, and I liked everything about it. Um, and I particularly liked the fact that Stephen King gave a quote that the quote itself did business right so it's what so got the movie thing, really ultimately made i think like they uh that's what no, no, got, no, got, the distri- no, got the got the distribution pardon me um yeah. was was because of that stephen king quote yeah i i, I think it might have been that the distributor himself got the quote i think oh okay but, um, but but i wouldn't swear to it but but the, the point being so i'm excited to meet sam raimi I, i'm thinking this is perfect i you know like we got we're gonna hit it out of the park and so um, my first question, because um, there's only one thing on my mind now as a producer, we just got the green light and, and getting the green light was no easy task um, to close this deal. Because see, the, the thing about corn is it was owned by the Howl Road Studios. And these are the right. people that make Spanky and our gang. These, <laughs> right, these, right. These fam- they do little rascals. They do these mm-hmm. family movies, you know, um, family uh, they own Laurel and Hardy movies um and, and what they were doing at the time was was just managing those properties they weren't even really making a lot of movies at that point in time right yeah so imagine that uh, how Roach himself has it's it was either his daughter or granddaughter or grandniece or somebody who's married to somebody who actually became an important executive at the company only through marriage hmm so apparently what he really liked to read more than children's books was Penthouse Magazine. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. And that's and where, where Stevens, uh, the story originally appeared. So as soon as he read it in July 77, he put two and two together and got four. He said, this is a movie about kids. My grandfather made movies about kids. My grandfather-in-law made movies about kids. I'm running the studios and make movies about kids. Stephen King's hot as a pistol. It's a movie about kids. We should make this movie about kids. <laughs> he never got it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, no, and, uh, yeah, uh, clearly. Clearly did not understand what he was doing here. But yeah. So, so at the point in time where, um, where Paul Allman believes he's closed a deal with, with the um, Hal Roach people, uh, he believes he's closed a deal with Doubleday. He believes he's closed a deal with King. And we're all in the room to sign. And, and people start renegotiating again. That's when I stand up. Now, I might have mentioned the fact that I was trying my best at the Jun Chung Martial Arts Studio and, and working out very hard. I was perhaps in my physical prime at this point. And so when I stood up and said in a loud voice as I took the chair and garroted it in, into the, the doorknob so that nobody could open the door and leave the room, I said, nobody's leaving this fucking room until this thing's signed. We're going to shoot a movie in five weeks. Yeah, everybody wow. understand this? And, and everything got signed. So, so I know now we're shooting a movie in five weeks and I know why it's five weeks because I've done a three week study on the growing patterns of corn and I've done a, a five week study on uh, employing miners in, in different states. Mm. And, and Iowa wants our movie so badly that in the three weeks we've been talking to them, five weeks before production, going into this meeting, 
I already have the State Assembly of Iowa has passed a law that says that children of the corn, I forget the wording, if it was either exempted from child labor laws altogether or deemed able to use the same child labor laws that that Iowa has for 100 years allowed farmers to use during the months of August and September when they detassel corn and they let kids work from dawn till dusk, 18-hour days sometimes, 12 yeah. hours. Yeah. And they do this, and it's a matter of law there. And so we got the same exemption. So I'm thinking, my corn's going to harvest. I want to shoot it in Iowa. This, And so now I'm, I'm going into this meeting with Sam Raimi with the right to make the movie, the money to make the movie. I need a director to make the movie. I've got the right casting director. And, and I'm not afraid of putting a production together fast. I, sure. I was throwing commercials together for James Bond in 24, 48 hours, you know. So I, I know I got the Rolodex with every stunt guy, every animal guy, everything I need. And, and, and so uh, I said, how long was, was pre-production on that movie? He said, oh, wait. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm recalling a conversation from 30 years ago, and I might not have the exact time frame, but I seem to recollect him saying something in the neighborhood of a, a year and a half. He, he might as well have just said a half a year and would have had the exact same response. But I remember it being extraordinarily long. Mm. And, mm. and and so I said, um, well, are, are, are you going to be able to, to prep this in five weeks to your second movie and, and you have no experience prepping fast. I said, are, are, are we going to have problems with that? Like, I'm hoping he's going to say things like, no, I'll defer to other people if, if fast decisions have to be, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm hoping, you know, that, that, so I can make sure I can get them. And, and um, he says, no, I don't imagine we can make this start date. Huh. Now, you know, Sandy Howard taught me how to produce movies. I trained on his desk and one of the, cardinal rules of producing a movie is you never take a green light picture and turn it red yourself <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's bad enough that um, warner brothers is selling off domestic rights to lethal weapon five they won't release batgirl and they won't release jamie fox new movie for finished pictures you mm -hmm. don't want to sabotage yourself when you haven't even got the dough yet i mean you, you know, and, and here's and here's him, Sam coming in and properly asking for what he needs. And and as a successful director doing his second picture, I support the decision that he should get what he needs. It just seemed like two left shoes. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem it, it didn't seem like something that was going to work. So that's when I immediately moved on to Tommy Lee Wallace because he was somebody who I knew. Oh, OK. So, I, and, I mean, and, and you had also been through the Beastmaster situation, which I, that's Coscarelli's second movie. So you didn't want to certainly have that kind of issue all over again where somebody was not. But the thing was, Coscarelli was producible. He never made a statement, committed an act, conducted himself in any way that was antagonistic, counterproductive. Right. It, it, it was just, um, you know, get, get out the electric prod and make him leave. You know, it, it wasn't... <laughs> And believe me, I wanted the movie he was directing. I didn't want anybody else to direct it. Sure, but, but, he, sure. but, but you could see the problems Coscarelli was having on, on one day alone, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, not making shot lists, you know, you know, you, you, when you have well, a limited I, I, budget, you know, you really got to know what you're doing. I remember the day we were working on the lake and what you're supposed to do when you, when you work on, on, on this kind of thing. You're supposed to have two boats, right? When, when you send one rowboat to the camera, position across the water you return one rowboat to the original position they always cross at the same time that's the right way to run a production the, mm -hmm. the reason being that you'll always have a way to evacuate an emergency if you only have one boat and you send somebody from the island you're going to have to wait for it to round trip to come back <laughs> right. and get it first. right you right you don't, never want to do it and, and if you're principally moving from the island then, then at one point you have two boats there, you release one and, and you always have an escape, right? So um, John Coscarelli, they, they call rap and he takes the boat and he goes to lunch. Mark Singer comes out of the water. He's dripping wet, would very much like to get in a boat to go to lunch. And there's only one boat. And I don't know how they mucked it up. I, I had given them two and they had done something and they mm. weren't running the right way. As soon as Mark Singer comes to shore, he, he just runs over to Coscarelli and cold talks him. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. See, Don wasn't mean spirited. He was just absent minded. Mm. So, so mm. he's very producible. Sam Raimi was fiercely knowledgeable. 
it, it, on his second picture, meeting him once for the first time, he knew what his needs were. He knew what it would take. He knew what, what it, yeah, I can make this movie, knock it out of the box. And this, this is, you know, and, and so what? It, you won't have it for next March. And, and once again, Sandy Howard taught me how to produce movies. If you have a fucking release date, you fucking release it. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. It, 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 it is not a God-given birthright that a movie gets made or Correct. that a made movie gets distributed or a made mm-hmm. movie gets distributed in a movie theater. Right. And, and, right. and if New World has said, you are our March picture, well, then I'm going to be their March picture. Right. So I went right on to Tommy Lee and, and Tommy Lee, I, I demanded a fast answer. And he didn't like the fact that um, I was shooting non-DGA. Okay. And the reason I was shooting non-DGA was that the, it was the straw on the camel's back that got New World to change their mind from the howling to corn. Because the argument that was be ma- being made by the pro-howling people was howling is a hit franchise. This will be easy to sell. We're the next entry. We'll say howling three, whatever the, the fuck it was. And everybody will, will get that it's a howling, right? Right. And so I made, I made the argument that Firestarter was an $8 million picture, that Cujo was an $8 million picture, that in our March date would put us as a $1.5 million picture between these two $8 million pictures. You sell Stephen King, and if we do not sign either the Writers Guild or the Directors Guild agreements, which at the time was possible because at the time Stephen King screenplay as an outright purchase without him continuing to write on it, was viable as an outright purchase without having to sign a WGA agreement, all legal okay. and everything. Got it. And George, okay. and, and George Goldsmith, the actual writer, had not yet joined the WGA. And so employing him to do additional drafts wasn't WGA. So the, the WGA and DGA have very strong possessory credit language about the appearance of directors and writers' names before a title, size, type, placement, when it's indispensable. But if you don't sign either agreement, I said, the name of my movie is Stephen King's Children of the Corn. I said, that's what I'm going to register in the copyright office. And I said, now, if you look at the Hal Roach agreement, I remember this today, paragraph 5A. Wow. Stephen King sold us his name and likeness. We, We own it. We could actually put a picture of King on the poster and say Stephen King's Children of the Corn with his face if we wanted to. <laughs> I said, and, co- and coming out between two Stephen King mainstays, all you have to do next year is bet that, that Paramount and MGM don't fuck it up. And they're not going to. They're $8 million movies. We're going to do great. And we did great. I yeah. mean, you saw it. Yeah. And, we did great. and so that's how I, I got the final green light, was convincing them that um, Stephen King's Children of the Corn... And that, in turn, is what made me lose Tommy Wallace, because if I wouldn't sign the DGA agreement, he wouldn't go forward with it. And that's what made maybe Fritz Kirsch sort of the right director for it. Not only did you know he could go fast because he'd worked on all those commercials, but he also wasn't a DGA member. Walter Koblenz um, summed it up the best after he saw the movie. Um, He walked up to me and he says, this guy, Fritz Kirsch, he's a shooter. Commercials, right? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, you can tell. And, and that really, I got a whole history lesson from Walter that one night in that simple conversation about the difference between a director like Ken Russell, who's going to interpret drama and leave you with um, a meaningful um, takeaway. You're, you're going to want to have a cup of coffee and a conversation after you watch what he just sent you through. Fritz is a shooter. He's, he's going to give you cinem- c- cinematic execution that doesn't elevate or descend whatever you give him. He's going to shoot the fuck out of it. Right. I, right. I mean, you're not going to need to tell him to use gels and, and diffusion. He's going to bring that to the table. Right. But, Richie, yeah. but, but, but he's not going to, he's not going to make um, any of the parts. Better. Um, now, Children of the Corn does really well at box office. I mean, was there any discussions of a sequel at that point? Did, no. So there was never I, a thought at that point to make a second Children of the Corn? I came into the business um, first through radio in junior achievement in 73, 74, and then television through Beyond Our Control in junior achievement in 75, 6, and 7, and then from AFCO Embassy in 78 through New World in 82. Sequels were never on my radar. It isn't a mm. conversation I ever had. Nobody was thinking about franchises. It, wasn't anything that was 
we were thinking about making movies. You know, I mean, right. the, the, three, the, the five things that we looked for in a movie when I was buying at Avco Embassy, take us to places we've never been, one. Show us things we've never seen, two. Um, favorite movie stars, three. R-rated titillation, four. You know, exploitative fare. And, and then five was the je ne sais quoi, that, that thing that's going to happen when you find a Rocky or you find, uh, you know, an original. And that was it. And that's why we made movies. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Because even in the Corman era, too, the sequels were not something that really got made very often. I mean, he... Let me tell you, if nobody's ever explained this to you, sequels are the product of a transformation that happened in the mid to late 70s into the 80s when the studio Mavericks, like Robert Evans, could greenlight a movie like um, Godfather and Sherry Lansing could run a studio, to the MBAs who could figure out how to make more money. And, and mm. they realized that the formula for success is to repeat success. And they have no strategy to originate success. That's why under the current watch, the only thing you will ever see made is something from a comic book universe because comic books translate very well to um, three-dimensional linear storytelling. It, it's, right. You'd rather watch a comic book than read it. That, that's just the truth. Um, IPs, books are going to keep getting made into films. And, and that's never changed. If you go back to the silent, the silent films of, of 1910s and 20s, half of them are stage plays. Sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. So what, what's happening is... is, is that's what it's all about now. It's all about IPs and sequels and franchise. And, and then, and, and it, especially if you're Disney or Pixar, like, do we have shit for the store? Right. right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Merchandise. Yeah. And, and so um, I, I, I think movies, this is my prediction. There will be an entrepreneur that is not trying to make billions of dollars, but he's happy making tens of millions to hundreds of millions. And he will create a theatrical de distribution network amongst these desperately starving theaters that are starting to come back from COVID. And he will, and he will release some successful foreign films the way Joe Levine did in, in the 60s and, and start to revive uh, an appetite for actual movies. And this, these movies will all be made under a new label that makes movies for theatrical distribution. And they're not worried about... They're not worried about a studio or a streamer because there's no competition there. It's, it's just we're going to make our money in the theaters. And we're probably a few years away from that. Wow. I, 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 I've, I've been, th I've I been thinking about right. doing it myself. I've been thinking about doing it myself because if you look at the way Quentin Tarantino has the Arrow Theater. Uh, right? the, the New Beverly, yes. The, the New Beverly, right. The New yes. Beverly, thank you. Um, you could start there. An entrepreneur could do the same kind of thinking nationally and say I, i'm going to pick 50 sacred cities the top top 50 market cities and, and i'm going to uh, take take uh, 100 movies and, and jockey them around yeah it's like if my, alamo, my, my, alamo draft house started just basically distributing at that kind of level. in every city right. yeah in every city yeah yeah I, I i think that'll be the kickstarter and i think that'll prime enough money so they can say things like you know maybe uh uh, Jim Jarmusch has this movie. He wants to shoot for eight hundred thousand. That might work for us. Yeah, yeah, I would. I'd see yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I and I think that's going to be the hope for future theatrical experiences. Wow. Yeah, because I hope you're, I hope the, you're right. Well, what the theater doesn't offer today that it used to offer is something unique. If you don't watch it in the theater, you're not going to see it. Period. That used to be what it was when I was growing up in the seventies. If I didn't go and pay to watch to see Godfather, I wasn't going to see that movie. Right. Right. It, it's true. It's true that I would have another shot at it a few years in syndication, but you're not thinking that. Right. Yeah. You're not like, oh, I'll get to see it on TV in three years. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you want to go into the theater. And, and they're starting to sell movies that way where it says exclusively in theaters. Like they say, end the trailers that way to try to say, you got to go see this in the theater. The problem is they're not branding it. See, there's no distinguished, it's just happenstance. Like Disney has new movie number 12, right? Right. This one, right. this one's day and date, but this one you got to see in the theater first for two months because there's that much demand. Right. It's not distinguishing right. it. What's going to distinguish is it is when you start to figure out what the brand is. See, like when, when New Line figured out Nightmare on Elm Street, they figured out we are a horror company. Right. 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 
I don't think with Blumhouse and streamers that that's a successful choice anymore. But I, I think that when you get into things like an Alan Rudolph film or a David Mamet film, I think, you know, you're talking about something all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. When we talked to David Simpkins, he told us that you uh, worked out the rights for Children of the Corn for the franchise. Yes. And are you now the owner of the franchise? The franchise is um, bifurcated. Here's the disposition. If you start with the premise of everything and say that I own it, except, except that because of a copyright law that are known as the Sonny Bono laws in the territory of the United States, starting um, two years ago, Stephen King got a reversion of rights for future unmade um, sequel spinoffs, pre prequels, but that only affects the territory of the United States. Mm, okay. So for instance, um, what my plan is, I don't know if you saw the, um, the European TV show, it's about seven or eight years old called The Revenant, The Returned. Sure. Yeah, pretty great show, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they, they made that with a business model where they could make a TV series in the horror genre about children without needing to sell the United States market. That's the business model that I need to copy to make my children the corn um, presentation. I've, I've written the uh, pilot for uh, a 10 hour series. Okay. And what, the, what the gag is, is that it's a um, hundred years in the future and the children are running the world. Wow, okay. That, that, that's the general that's yeah, the general could, okay because yeah. you also then directed you directed the the uh, like a remake in 2009 yes that's the only remake there's been an original that i produced in 84 and then a remake what what prompted me to do the remake was um i had written what i thought was the definitive the definitive fraternity comedy movie i happen to believe that frat comedies are a singular genre the way that rom-coms are a genre unto themselves. And I believe that um, fraternity comedies are an undersupplied and over-demanded market. So um, along with uh, a producer colleague, uh, Tommy Reed, T Tara Reed's brother, um, he, he brought in Michael Karn, who, who had just either written or about to write Mr. Woodcock. And the three of us wrote this script called Pledge Class. It's kick-ass fucking funny. And um, I got it over to um, to Ali um, um, when she, Allison uh, when she was still president at Universal, and, and she read it, and she said, I, "I fell off the couch laughing." And then she said something that was then echoed by Martha De Laurentiis, and then echoed by Kevin Kasha, and and by every uh, Tony Safford, every, every pickup guy I knew at the studios that was buying films that I could sell to. They all said the same thing without comparing notes. They said, there's no stakes. Now, D Steve Martin had just come out with a film the same year I was packaging this um, with Queen Latifah, like bringing down the house or something. Yeah. Right. And, it, and it, there were stakes. I mean, it, in the third act, there's a gun and there's life and death and, and, and there's stake. And, and my script never promised it. My script was Animal House, you know, they, Nobody's right. going to die in Animal House. It's a comedy. And, and that, well, that's what I kept arguing. And um, I, I, I went and um, there's a, a way that independent producers like myself put deals together. We, we make a list of 10 potential actors who odds are one of them will probably do it. I mean, you, you don't put um, Tom Cruise on the same list as your cousin Ernie. Right. I mean, right, if you put... Right. You put 10 people of the same ilk and odds are you'll get one of them if you're not overreaching. Well, I had a way of, of having the script read by the managers and having them not passed of saying that I get a bull for my script was uh, Kathleen Turner for the mother, Tim Allen for the father and, and Frankie Munoz for the kid. And that's a hell of a package. And, and I heard from every one of these buyers that um, with no stakes, even that package you know, we want to see the movie first. Hmm. And so, and so this is why I ended up directing Children of the Corn, long story, but I, you want steaks? <laughs> I'll give you steaks. I'll remake fucking Children of the Corn because <laughs> I'm the only one, I'm the only one in the world. And I know this for a fact that kept a copy of the script King wrote and I have it and, it and it's on hard copy and there's no digital anything ever. We didn't have computers back in the eighties. 
Right. And, 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 and I know I have the only copy. I said, so I'll just set up his movie. I'll, I'll do a rewrite on it, maybe grab some credit. And the Writers Guild determined that I had principal writing credit. But all I Great. did was take a short story in his script and synthesize it. And, and there's also another, was it, is it another remake? But there is another Children of the Corps movie that has yet to be released, but did get shot okay. during the pandemic. Yes. What happened there was I, I licensed my rights because at the time, remember, I just told you that Stephen King got his rights back two years ago. Correct. Well, I did this deal three years ago before he got his rights back. I, I did one last license. It was to Lucas Foster. I offered him the screenplay that um, I had, had had written about the future. And they turned it down and said, Kurt Wor Wor Wormer has a, t a take on it that's contemporary. He said, um, we just got to make sure we have the rights to it. He says, it's going to be like a prequel in terms of Kurt wants to explain what caused all of this. He says, but we're going to set it today. And so obviously, since the short story has established itself in the 80s, it couldn't technically be a prequel. He said, so it'll essentially be a spinoff, which approaches the material as a prequel would. Um, they're saying the children of the corn happened today. And this is the reasons why. And we'll explain that to you. And I read the script and I had suggested to them um, a number of very important things that I thought would make it anchored in the horror genre and pointed out to them that I felt that their current draft um, was very well written, but it was like a thriller, not like a horror movie. Right. And, and I said, he's like, the, and I, I think I used the word big fucking difference. I think I said something like that. <laughs> um, and I, and I told them how um, within the framework that they had, they could cut off the first five and last five pages and save 15% of their production costs. They could focus on the story. I showed them how by doing that, it, it hit every one of Sidfield's um, five major points. If, if they made these major horrific turns, like, and I'm saying things like, so this character should die here. You know, and they're saying things like, why? And I'm saying things like, but do you want me to write it? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, I can figure out 18 different reasons why and how. I'm just telling you what is going to make it a horror film. Right. You know, I, I, I said, this is the point in the original film where the kid sat up in the road that was really dead and we didn't think he was really dead. I said, here we do the opposite. Here, we're all in an open casket, paying homage to a kid who's obviously dead. And now he sits up, he's alive. And they say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, it's a fucking horror movie about kids who worship a god in a cornfield. How much <laughs> sense do you need to make? You need to scare the shit out of people. Right, right. And, and, and this was um, the point where I said, clearly, you don't want any of my advice. Thank you for the check. Okay. And, so that's, so and, they, you, off you... and they made their movie. And none of this is a particular surprise to me why, why they have not um, immediately gone to market selling a children of the corn for the first time thriller in a horror genre series okay. as good as it may want to be the audience is you go to a movie for a horror movie at one point in time you want to feel like you do on the roller coaster alan holtzman sat me down in 1983 and he had this chart of a roller coaster and he says the first thing that happens is nothing you go up 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 nothing happens and then, and then right into it, which Sid Fields calls your inciting incident, your stomach drops out. Right. Right. And then, and then you've got a couple of twists and a couple of turns, and then something really big happens. And that's when your first act turns. And, and he, had, he had a whole three act structure charted on a roller coaster over a course of a 180 second ride. And it made a great deal of sense to me. And, it, and, it, and, and, and I started to look at Joel Silver's formula, if you will. And I looked at um, uh, uh, really basic, um, every time there's a new medium, um, pornography always exists first. And so I looked at their storytelling formula, if you will. And, and it, what's really interesting, if you look at the early Chuck Norris movies and, 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 uh, and, and Bruce Lee movies, how story formulaically, <laughs> they're so derivative of porno movies. <laughs> because <laughs> you know, what, what's the difference between the two? Porno every fill in the blank X amount of minutes you want to see what you paid for. Right, well, right. Same thing with Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and then, then it's Sylvester Stallone, and then, you know, and, and, and you get the idea. Yeah, and, the, it, Corman had the same thing with, like, boobs or, or some sort of action set, set, set piece every, like, 10 minutes. So the same kind of structure. 
Yeah, and, and, and Corman distributed through Sam Markoff, and that was Sam Markoff's M.O. I mean, he did all the beach bikini movies and the biker movies. Mm-hmm. What, 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 who, who was the guy? They just did that Netflix special. Eddie Murphy played him that, that distributed with Sam, the, the colorful um, African-American actor. Um, uh, oh, Dolomite. You're talking about Dolomite. Yes, yeah. Dolomite. Yes. Um, Larry Karaszewski and Scott Alexander wrote the... the uh, yeah, and I, and, and I know him. them very well. Yeah. But, but Dolomite said it the best. He says, there's three things people want in a movie. Tits, tits, action, and jokes. They want to laugh, they want action, and they want to see breasts. Yeah. And, and I think he summed it up. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> look, at, look at Fatty Arbuckle. Look at W.C. Fields. Look at Mae West. I mean, it's never changed in a hundred years. And that was the first part of our interview with Donald P. Borchers, at least the Corntober section. Yes. That's our Corntober section of our Donald P. Borchers conversation. Man, epic. So great. Mm-hmm. So much good stuff. The amount of time that he gave us is, I mean, I can't yeah. express enough how appreciative yeah. we are. Yeah. He yeah. was incredibly generous with his time. Uh, and and just shared I mean the, the amount of stories that he shared with us that that we still haven't even got to yet. It's oh yeah, it's, oh it's yeah. incredible. Uh, just it uh, is, we were we, we, we're so fortunate to have this opportunity. And it is such a wide ranging conversation. He has done so much as a producer, and he's run into so many people, and he has so like it's just fascinating um, all the different stories he has. So thank you so much for joining us um, next month. This is going to be new war vember. We're going to have a whole month of the on the new world pictures noir that's right. world pictures podcast. I'm going to I'm going to get it right. right. I'm getting it right. I'm working on we're, it. it this, we're all I'm gonna, now. <laughs> we're all struggling with it, but we're going to make this thing work that we've decided <laughs> to theme the month. Of course, our tribute to Maria E Gates and her uh, noir vember hashtag. So this is going to be all the new the noir films that new world has put out of which there are maybe some we're not a hundred percent we're going to discuss <laughs> what we think might be noir films according to new world so to close this out please again we implore you go to donald's youtube page that's youtube.com slash c slash donald p borchers og or just google donald p borchers youtube and check out all the movies we talked about all the stuff he's got so much stuff on that page check it out subscribe to that channel and see all the stuff that he has going on in there. Cause he has, he's told us there's going to be even more that he debuts on that YouTube page. So check it out. And uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the new world pictures podcast. Bye everybody.